Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, good evening. Good morning. Uh, wherever you're joining us from across the globe, it's uh, great to have you with us today um, at Engage 6. Uh, my name is um, Oliver Seal. I head up the HELM program, the Higher Education Leadership and Management program at uh, University of South Africa, uh, USAF for short. And we're coming to you live from the capital of South Africa, Pretoria. We welcome, special welcome to our international guests from various countries, uh, continent, uh, from Europe. Um, it's really good to have you. And from Asia, it's fantastic uh, to see you here. Um, I think one of the, the upsides of COVID is that we can engage, although we sit in different time zones, uh, we can engage, and pun intended, around various issues in a, in a very dynamic um, and, and fascinating way. Uh, today's topic is really around mental health and mental well-being. I think one of the challenges we've seen uh, with COVID um, and the crisis that it's created in, in, in our universities, particularly around the people issues and how it has impacted on, on staff and students. So, we're really excited um, to, to be able to, to share with you today uh, this platform. Uh, we introduced uh, Engage last year, and this is the sixth edition um, of Engage um, as a, a vehicle for us to, to, to literally talk through um, and to share experiences on critical issues that impact us in, in the higher education sector and mental health, mental well-being being one. So we're really excited for the speakers that we have um, in our, in, on, in, in our, on our panel today that's gonna to present to you. Um, also the fact that uh, Engage will, will certainly, it, it's next, um, it's a monthly uh, uh, event. And next month we'll be talking around internationalization and our, our guest uh, international speaker will be Hans de Witt. So look out uh, for that communication. It's great uh, to have so many of you here. Uh, we're still seeing more and more people coming in. We saw a number of people signing up for this event and we look forward to a really dynamic um, and a very robust um, um, platform for a discussion on, on the topic, as I said earlier, which is of, of vital importance for the well-being of our higher education sector in South Africa, but uh, dare I say also globally so thank you very much to the team who pulled this together. I'm looking forward to some uh, exciting uh, inputs and then uh, feedback from you. We really encourage you as participants um, in this event to share your thoughts with us on, face, uh, on, on, on chat and we will, we will take up those when it's Q&A uh, time. Let me now hand over to Birgit Schreiber. Uh, Birgit is our program leader uh, for student success and also heads up and uh, is, uh, leads this process, leads this uh, activity uh, of Engage with Inhalm. Over to you, Birger. Thanks everyone, take care. And we hope you have a fantastic session. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Welcome to this first engagement of our USAF Helm Engage series for 2022. Thank you, Oliver, for these introductory um, comments. So we welcome um, over 100 participants today and it's testimony of the great need in the sector on engaging across the sector. And also it's of course about the topic itself. Mental health is not only a critical issue for our students, staff and colleagues, but many of us here today have had to grapple with it at one time or another. It's a universal issue. So we also welcome many international listeners today. Welcome to the VCs, DVCs, leaders in the NGO sector, representative from the DHET, academics and students, researchers, teachers, colleagues and friends. Our theme today, the high education state of mind, mental health of students and staff. So I'll frame the engagement today here briefly, and then we'll hear from two great researchers. Professor Jason Bankis from the MRC will present the national research that he and Professor Dan Stain from UCT conducted. It involves um, 78,000 students from 19 universities in South Africa and gives a very impressive and reliable snapshot of our state of mind. Then we hear from 
uh, Dr. Kea Mohetse Morve from the Department of Youth Studies at the University of Venda, and she will reflect on the intersection of higher education and staff mental health. So this topic today is particularly close to my heart as I've been a psychotherapist and led university counseling services for most of my life. I've met many young people who arrive in higher education with resilient hope and optimistic plans to learn and grow, but some arrive with scars and trauma experiences and leave higher education with more debt, more scars and more worries than they've arrived. I remember walking into our clinics at UCT, at, St at UWC, Stellenbosch and Fort Hare, and I see faces that are sad and anxious, tearful and frightened, and avoid eye contact, and most of all are ashamed, ashamed of the invisible burden that crushes their lives. This shame cuts across mental health. It's a silencer, a cloak of taboo. We have the opportunity to use the higher education experience to lift this burden of shame and break, and break the taboo, and make higher education an accepting and safe space where care and respect prevails. I'm not saying that higher education has a unique or sole responsibility to address mental health, but if we want to empower, help and heal our resilient and hopeful students and staff, then we in higher education have a unique opportunity to make this happen. Higher education is a good space and a better one than many public organizations and institutions, but we can do more for students and staff to lift the silence, break the taboo and offer prompt care and a context that offers a restorative experience. But higher education is not a sufficient context to break silences and enable healthy living. The wider context is responsible here too. The homes, families, communities, the schools, the churches, and organizations need to break the silence, offer support, and become wholesome, wholesome context, free of violence, neglect, lies, and corruption. In some of these toxic contexts, mental ill health, is an adaptive response to a world gone mad. So the wider context plays a critical role here. While in our context, women are violated, carry twice the burden in any crisis, when children are unsafe and racism and sexism prevails, when many of our families are desperate and angry and aggressive behaviors are normative, it is hard for higher education to impact on mental health. So it is the wider political, cultural and social context holding some of the causality that needs to shift to provide a safe space. Higher education can be a very good space, a safe space. We must not forget that many of our students and staff are robust and resilient and navigate higher education very successfully. But so too, higher education can be grueling and neglectful, brutalizing and stressful for many. Intersectionality, gender, socioeconomic contexts, disability are key correlates of mental health and these groups are most affected. And that needs to change. So the question is what we will do today here. Are we shifting silences around mental health here too? Which structures will we put in place? Which practices will we change? Which relationships will we build today that will lift the taboo and create an accepting and transformative context for our students and staff? We must, each one here must ask ourselves around our own attitudes and behaviors that perpetuate unhelpful stereotypes around mental health. Are we speaking out? Do we make healthy choices? Do we stand for self-care? Do we normalize help-seeking behaviors? Do we challenge sexism and racism? Do we challenge rape culture and corruption when we meet it? Do we monitor our online lives to stop when we notice the toxicity of online spaces? Do we, do we commit abuse in our relationships? Are we allies to those who need it? I can see that this is an individualized notion of mental health, and it's not only up to the individual. Mental health is a public health issue and sociocultural issue. It's a shared responsibility. So mental health for all involves all. While we look to the individual to seek help and somehow mobilize agency, the very thing that is eroded by mental health, it is our responsibility to establish scalable solutions, ensure access to mental health services, ensure that homes and communities are safe, are safe. So while our students go online to learn, we should ask them also to turn off their screens for some hours every day. When we speak about the contextualized learner, it's not just an epistemological concept, but a real one. Many of our students don't eat, sleep, or study in safe environments. And here we can make a difference. 
A campus experience should be an accepting, pluralist, and transformative experience. In, hey. a, previous in, in a previous engage, hey. I've mentioned. Yeah. Can I go on, Patrick? In a previous engage, I've mentioned that the pre COVID issues are not resolved. Poverty, access, gender based violence, and many more issues are not resolved. And our students are marching, angry and fed up with the vacuous promises of a better life. Our students arrive on campus with scars, with hunger, with worries for their families. And while these are not explicitly the issues for higher education to focus on, if we don't resolve these, we're unlikely to build a strong sector. What we've learned from COVID is that we are adaptable and agile. We're not powerless, but can build a new world in which students can live and learn in contexts that are safe and supportive and where we can shape mental health responses that are accessible, affordable, differentiated, and scalable. It's a multimodal approach, a public, community level, family level, and individual level, and we're part of all these levels. In my research with the Association for African Universities, we learned that we have resilient, self-driven, and optimistic students, taught largely by caring and hardworking staff. So yes, we have a lot of resources in the sector, we must use these intentionally to shape a higher education experience that breaks silences and changes social norms around mental health. We should give special support to the staff who are directly involved with student care, and we should give targeted education to the leadership and policymakers who shape the larger educational experience. So now back to today, Jason Bankes will share with us their findings. While much is frightening, there is also much hope and very good advice. Kiamoghetse Morve will speak to us about the staff experience and also hold up a mirror about our role in shaping our context. So together we will take a look at mental health across the sector and I hope you will get inspired to take agency to make a difference in the spaces in which you find yourself in. So now briefly about today, um, as always, we're recording the sessions. The PowerPoints are available to you afterwards. You will get a link um, in the YouTube channel um, after the registration, probably by tomorrow. Um, at the end of our session, we will have an evaluation, which we're asking you to please fill in. And now let me introduce our first speaker. Professor Jason Bainches is an extraordinary associate professor at the Institute for Life Course Health Research at the Department of Global Health at Stellenbosch University. He's the Chief Specialist Scientist at the South African MRC. He has researched and published widely in the field of mental health of students, staff, and higher education in local and global contexts. Jason, we'll have you for a while. Then we have some question and answers. Then we go over to Kiamo, and then we again have some question and answers, and we wrap up at half past three. But Jason, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for that um, introduction. Colleagues, it's a great uh, privilege to, to be here this afternoon and thank you very much for, for inviting me um, to be part of this, uh, Brigitte and Oliver um, and the others, uh, other organizing committee. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Let me get my presentation in front of me. Record progress. So, uh, as, the, as, as was said in the introduction, the, the purpose of this presentation, which lasts about 35, 40 minutes um, this afternoon, is to share with you some of the results of the South African National Student Mental Health Survey, which was conducted in, in 2020. This initiative was uh, started by University of South Africa um, in, in kind of growing awareness that there was a need to do something about student mental health and to try and quantify the, the extent of, of the problem and identify potential points of intervention. The South African Medical Research Council provided funding um, for this research. And this presentation that I'm gonna share with you was prepared by Professor Dan Stein um, and myself, but we're by no means the, the only people who were involved in this research. It's a, it's a massive undertaking. The research team was large and significant. So I don't wanna create the impression that we were the um, only people you know, involved in this. We are just the mouthpieces for a, for a much, much larger study. Colleagues, I also need to say before I get into the body of this presentation that I have a visual impairment, which means that sometimes I might need to get really close to the screen just to remind myself of um, what's on the slide or, or what the numbers say. Um, I apologize if the camera angle gets a, a bit weird um, at those times when I, when I lean, um, lean in. 
So this National uh, Student Mental Health Survey, we um, hooked into an international body of uh, the World Mental Health, um, sorry, the World Health Organization's World Mental Health Surveys International College Student Initiative, which is quite a mouthful, but it's, it's an international uh, consortium of researchers. Um, they're the same group that were responsible for the World Mental Health Surveys, and they've more recently turned their attention to, to the health of, of university students or college students. We very intentionally partnered with this uh, group in, in putting together the National Mental Health Survey, given that uh, it allowed us access to, to quite sophisticated um, psychiatric epidemiological tools to assess the mental health of students. It gave us access to uh, comparative data from other countries, which was which, which is helpful in making sense of, of some of the findings. Of course, there are limitations in conceptualizing a, a student mental health survey within the, the context of the world mental health surveys, because it's very much framed about around psychopathology, around identifying students who are likely to meet diagnostic criteria for a diagnosable psychiatric condition. So it takes a very, very particular psychiatric view um, of student wellness. And, and, I, and I say that as a, as a, a limitation of, of the survey, but I think it's also one of the strengths of the survey because what it does is it, it quantifies for us the number of students who are likely to meet diagnostic criteria for a disorder. This is not the same as students who are um, stressed or uh, you know experiencing distress at the at, at, as a result of a of a romantic breakup, unless they were likely to meet uh, diagnostic criteria for um, a, a psychiatric condition. The survey that took a long time to, to put together, we piloted it in 2015, we piloted it again in 2017. Um, between 2017 and 2020, there was a, a, a large amount of consultation with people about what should be included in the survey, what should be excluded in the survey. And as you can imagine, there are a large number of things that people would want to know at a national level about our students, about food insecurity, about housing insecurity, um, about daily stresses. But there's only so much you can put into a survey. Students, you can hold their attention in a survey for maybe 15 minutes, and we kind of pushed the limit to, to closer to 25, 30 minutes um, with this survey, but it meant that we had to leave some, some things out. So this survey is, is a snapshot of what's going on in the country. It's by no means the final word, um, and it's by no means an exhaustive picture of, 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 of what um, is happening. We did include uh, things like uh, treatment seeking, gender-based violence. Uh, we did actually include questions about um, food insecurity. So there's a, a huge amount of, of data here. The data I'm going to present this afternoon are the preliminary results. This database will take us years to, to mine properly and, and to present the data in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Um, but I'm sharing with you the preliminary results because we can't wait years before we start uh, using this information to, to inform interventions. We invited all 26 publicly funded universities in South Africa to participate, but in the end, only 19 uh, universities were able to take us up um, on that and to, to, uh, to work with us to send out the survey. The survey was just of undergraduate students. Um, we planned the survey for 2020, and we were just about to go live um, the week South Africa went into to lockdown for the COVID uh, pandemic. This kind of presented a bit of a dilemma to us because we had to make a decision about whether to, to go ahead with the survey, to, to put the survey on hold, to postpone it. Very soon it became apparent that the pandemic was not going to disappear, that there'd been a huge amount of preparation for the survey. And so we decided to go ahead with, with the survey. The first responses were sent out in about April 2020, um, and we continued in waves to recruit students into this until about November um, of 2020. A total of about 28,000 students engaged with the, the survey. This is an incredible number of, of students. It makes it one of the largest student mental health surveys um, in the world. Of course, not all 28,000 finished the survey, um, and the data I'm going to share with you this afternoon is, is for the 29,000 students who told us which university they were at. And um, I'll tell you why that, uh, you'll see why that becomes an important variable um, later on in the slide. There are also, the, this 29,000 students answered all the questions. So we have a complete data set um, for these 29,000 students. We will in time impute data for, for the rest and increase the size of, of that sample for, for more um, subtle analyses. But for the purpose of this uh, broad overview, um, that seemed like a, a good place to start. Here's a, a description of the, the sample of students who completed the survey um, in terms of, of gender, 
uh, whether they're international students and self-identified population group. And the proportions of the survey respondents more or less matched um, the, 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 the shape or the, the, the demographic profile of students in South Africa. There were um, differences. And so we did weight the data. Um, for example, we oversampled female uh, students in the, in the survey. And so we had to weight the, that aspect of the survey to make sure that the, the data was representative. There were also quite significant variations in the response rates. Um, Rhodes University, for example, had an incredibly um, high response rate, and there were other universities with, with a quarter of the response rate that um, Rhodes University had. And so we needed to adjust for that as well, so that one university... Jason? Yes, sorry. Jason, sorry, can I interrupt you? You know, um, your, your slides are not moving along. So we oh, are, we can see sure. the first one. Um, Thank you for highlighting the... that. Let mm -hmm. me see what I can do here. I think it's going uh, to presentation mode. And then move along. There it is. Now we're on the slide three of 30. Um, and then is that the one with the demographic profile? That's yep. right. Yeah. And can I just make sure that they advance now? Is that the next one? Perfect. That's cool. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, sorry. So let me repeat that. This is the, the demographic profile of the, of the respondents um, to the survey. And, it, and it, as I said, it more or less matches the demographic profile of, of students in the country. We did adjust for it to take account of uh, universities where there were high levels of, of participation. And we did adjust for it um, to account for oversampling. So there were two weighting factors um, applied to the data. Uh, prior to, to analysis. This was an attempt to try and make the data more representative. And as I say, to iron out uh, differences in response rates um, before that. Sorry, uh, did I do the wrong thing there? The most uh, perhaps interesting and I think perhaps controversial uh, aspect of the, of the survey was we, we asked student this students this question about how would you um, rate your, your subjective mental health? How do you rate your mental health right now? Um, and this is the, the response in terms of, of how students, and this is at a particular point in time, um, but the proportion of students who responded that they rated their, their mental health excellent, very good, good, fair, or, or poor. And I think it's, it's, it's noteworthy that 82% um, percent of, of South African students at a point, point in time during the COVID pandemic reported that they had good or excellent mental health. Now, there are a couple of things that are, are, are significant about that. If we kind of round uh, down, it means that there are about 20% of students who who have poor mental, mental health. 20% um, is an, a significant number of students. It's a, it's a large number of students who are in need of support, who are in need of, of services, but it's by no means 100% uh, of students. And I think that that's an important thing to, 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 to keep in mind. The reason I make such a big deal of, of this, this uh, self-reporting of subjective well-being and 80% of, of students reporting that their, their mental health was, was either good or excellent, is that there is that there does seem to be a narrative um, around that, that put, perhaps perpetuates an idea that all students are in psychological distress, um, that positions all students as, as patients in need of psychiatric services. And, and this is not true. I mean, that kind of narrative contributes to the idea of a diminished student or you know, a, a vulnerable students. And it, 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 it belies the fact that there are students who are doing really, really well and high levels of resilience and, 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 and coping um, among that. But having said that, there are 5% of students, about 5% of students who's, who have serious clinical symptoms, uh, serious uh, psychological um, states of mind that require uh, specialist intervention. And there are about another 15% with, with moderate symptoms that will require you know, low intensity um, interventions. And, and we'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about what, those, what the nature of those uh, um, psychological difficulties are. But for now, just in broad terms, to think about the, you know, this kind of two-tier approach almost of 15% who, who would require uh, low intensity interventions, about 5% who would, would require more uh, severe interventions. Also, the, the, the interesting thing I think about um, the slide here is that it reminds us that the proportion of students, you know, the strategies that would be needed to move students from good to, to very good or from very good to excellent mental health. And obviously our, our goal is to move all students to, to excellent mental health. But the strategies that would be required to move someone from good mental health to excellent mental health 
are very different from the strategies that would be needed to move someone from poor mental health to, to good mental health. And so there is a need to think about stratified um, interventions that, that meet students where they are, acknowledging that not students, not all students are in the same place and that not all students are um, you know, necessarily uh, completely uh, falling apart or experience themselves as, as having bad um, mental health. Having said that, we did then go on to assess uh, symptoms and to, to try and identify students who are likely to, to meet diagnostic criteria. As I say, we used the questions and the algorithms that were refined in the World Mental Health Survey. So we're fairly confident that the, the students we've identified here would meet diagnostic criteria um, if they were in a, in a clinical interview. And you can see, as kind of might be expected, the, the high rates of, of major depressive disorder, about 15.4%, generalized anxiety disorder, about 10.9%, panic disorder, 72 and bipolar spectrum disorder, 1.8. I say that's uh, to be expected, but there may be some of you who are looking at those figures and thinking that those seem quite low. Uh, you know, they, they, perhaps we would have expected closer to 20 or 25% with, with, with major um, depressive episode. And I'll, and I'll say something about why that, that might be the case um, in, a, in a moment. The, the other disorders which, which were prevalent, I mean, obviously, you know, anxiety and depression are, are, are things we, we expected to find. But I think it's important to also uh, highlight that large numbers of students who, who met diagnostic criteria for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, students who would have met uh, criteria for a substance use disorder, for alcohol dependence, and for post-traumatic stress disorder. The proportion 21% of, of individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder is an inordinately high number of, of individuals who are um, experiencing symptoms. Keep in mind that these prevalence rates here are 30-day prevalence rates. So it's anyone who would have met criteria in the last 30 days. That's different from the first question, which asked students at this point in time, at this moment in time, a kind of point prevalence of uh, subjective psychological distress. So these figures are going to be larger than that. We, we don't see the 20% threshold here. We see larger than that because the time span is larger. In comparing these rates to, to other prevalence rates you might have seen, typically uh, surveys of students in the past have reported 12 month prevalence rates, um, which would also of course be higher because they count all students who would have met diagnostic criteria in the, in the last 12 months. These proportions that I'm presenting here, as I say, are just students that would have met diagnostic criteria in, in, in the last 30 days. What's interesting about these low um, proportions, and to make this point, I'm just gonna focus on generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and major depressive disorder. I've shown here in the first column, the, the one that's highlighted, the overall prevalence rates across all universities. But the particular uh, social and political history of, of the country has created uh, an educational landscape where there are uh, different kinds of universities, different types of universities with, with very different uh, histories and, and, and resource endowments. And I think it is interesting to look across those different broad groups of, of universities to see what, what happens with prevalence rates. And the first thing you notice is that prevalence rates are consistently higher um, at historically white institutions, that students in these institutions appear to be um, reporting much, much higher levels of, of distress. And, I, and I'll talk a little bit about why I think that might be the case um, in a moment. But also the distance learning university, the, um, the University of South Africa, has very low, consistently the lowest um, proportion of, of individuals um, with, who would meet criteria for, for, a, for a psychiatric disorder. And that makes sense given that a large number of students at UNISA are over the age, age of 35. Um, at historically white institutions, there are a lot of students who are under the age of, of 19. And we know that younger age uh, among university students is very much associated with, with psychological distress. Younger students experience high levels of psychological distress, um, probably because they're adjusting to, to university, but also probably because those with, with um, psychological uh, symptoms are, are very likely to drop out of university um, during their undergraduate years. So but by the time they get, if you if you sample students who are 22, 23 years of age, they, the ones with, with mental illness have already uh, fallen out of the system. They've already been lost to the system. And so you see declining uh, rates of, of, of um, psychological dist distress in, in older students. What this means is that with UNISA having such low prevalence rates and keeping in mind that UNISA accounts for just under 
half of the university students, half of the undergraduate university students in the country. Sorry, excuse me. This skews the overall, <clears throat> sorry, <I'm clears throat> try that again. <clears throat> this skews the, the overall proportion. So when we look at the overall proportions for these disorders, they're lower than we would find in historically white institutions because they're unbalanced by these uh, figures from, from the University of South Africa. This pattern of disorders was that I'm, I'm only focusing here on three disorders, um, but the same pattern was observed across all disorders, um, indicating a very kind of stable pattern. The prevalence, uh, the, the um, what I've tried to indicate in that last column is that these are statistically different, statistically significant differences across the university. So even if you take into account the confidence intervals for those prevalence estimates, they don't overlap. They do seem to be these consistent differences in, in, in distribution of mental illness. The other thing about historically white institutions <coughs> is they have a higher proportion of um, female students um, marginally, and we know that the prevalence rates for, for psychological distress seem to be higher among female students, but they also have a higher proportion of students um, who are gender non-conforming. Um, and those students are also at increased risk of, of psychological distress. And that might also account for why historically white institutions are, are reporting these higher rates for, for um, psychopathology. An interesting question then to ask is, is are there particular students who are more at risk? And I started to talk a little bit about this already saying that we expect that the younger students are at higher risk. We expect female students to be at higher risk. I think what was interesting here is that as expected, um, the risk of, of mental disorder was lower among students 31 years and older. It was slightly elevated among students 19 years and younger. It was uh, elevated among gender non-conforming and female students relative to male students. It was elevated among sexual minorities relative to, to heterosexual students. And we defined here uh, sexual minorities as anyone who reported, um, sorry, we reported, we defined here heterosexual students as, as students who reported no same sex attraction um, and sexual minorities would have been LGBT um, students, self-identifying. Um, and obviously parental level of education was, was associated with, with uh, increased, uh, the risk of, of, of mental illness with lower levels of parental education being the risk factor. And that kind of makes sense that first generation students would, would be at, at higher risk than, than other students. I think it is significant so that, that we can highlight these as kind of very particular risk factors. And this was a consistent pattern across all universities. These risk factors um, held up with more or less um, these kinds of, 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 of risk ratios. I've shown here the risk ratios for any disorder um, across all um, universities. But these risk ratios are very modest. I mean, we're talking about like a 1.3, if we look at gender non-conforming students, gen gender non-conforming students are 1.3 times more likely uh, to report a, 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 psych a psychiatric disorder. This is not a, a huge proportion. It's not like of the order of two or three or four. Um, and so these, these they're modest uh, risk factors. I think this is interesting in, in terms of the political history of the country and, the, and the, the efforts that have been made within universities for, for transformation, because it does seem that like historically privileged groups, and I think here about, for example, um, male heterosexuals, uh, that their, their level of privilege is in terms of risk for mental illness, certainly, their level of privilege is, is declining, um, although there, there is still this, this disparity in, 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 in the distribution of, of psychological disorders. What's interesting about population group is that there was a different pattern of, observed here across universities. For the previous risk factors, as I said, there was a consistent pattern of, of, of risk factors regardless of the type of institution. But what we found is that black students, um, and these are black African students and um, students who identified as, as um, Asian or colored, these students who attend historically white institutions were at, at, at higher risk of, of mental illness compared to, to white students. And I think that says something um, perhaps about the, the 
the, the culture of, of these institutions about levels of, of alienation and marginalization. Of course, our survey doesn't provide insight into exactly why um, we're seeing these, these, uh, this higher risk among black students in historically white institutions, but it does flag for us that there, there is something um, going on here that, that requires more investigation and, and, and better understanding. I'm often asked about the, the impact of, of COVID. And, and I said earlier that we had piloted this survey in 2015 and 2017. So we have data from pre-COVID. We only have that, that data from University of Cape Town and Stellenbosch University where the pilots were done, but it was possible for us to look at the prevalence rates in those universities for uh, 2015, 2017 and 2020, and to make a comparison of, of prevalence rates. And I report here the prevalence rates observed among first year university students at um, this was the University of Cape Town during 2017 and 2020. And then in the in the last two columns, there is an attempt to to establish whether this is a significant difference from 2017 to 2020. And there are no significant differences in increased prevalence for for major depressive um, episode generalized anxiety disorder or suicidal ideation between 2017 and 2020 at, at, at UCT. We see a very, very similar pattern at, at Stellenbosch University. Um, and there's, uh, there's probably a, a, a number of, of reasons for that. But one of the things that stands out immediately when, when you look at this table is that the rates of, of psychological distress among first year students at UCT were already very high in 2017. It's hard to increase from 39.9% prevalence for, for, for major depressive episode. That's almost, you know, what's that, two, uh, four, uh, oh, I can't do my, 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 my son's here, four tenths. So it's what, two fifths of students um, who, who, who are made, already met criteria in 2017. And we must remember that 2017, this was hot on the heels of, of things like fees must fall, which had, had significantly disrupted university campuses in, in, in 2017. And I think what this highlights is that yes, COVID was, was distressing and disruptive for, for universities, but actually university students have, have been experiencing distress, um, a, a, a lot of distress in the past. This, this is just another adversity um, that, that, that affects the, the well being of students, and that a students' rates of mental illness were already steadily increasing from 2015. Um, the changes from 2015 to 2017 were no larger than the changes from 2017 to, to 2020. Um, and that's interesting and, and, and important to notice. It might also highlight the fact that when we talk about COVID and we talk about the distress that's, that's been caused, there is a difference between talking about psychological distress, like being distressed about something and having to adjust to it versus having a diagnosed depressive disorder or anxiety disorder. Adjusting to the vicissitudes of life is not the same as a major depressive episode. Um, and I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. If we say that you know, psychological um, rates of psychopathology haven't increased for students during COVID-19 or haven't necessarily increased, that doesn't mean that there aren't students who are distressed um, and, 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 are, and are having difficulties um, adjusting. The other thing that's interesting about this data is we, so we asked about uh, current symptoms, we asked about the, the, the trajectory of these system, symptoms, when did they start? Um, and so we can get uh, estimates of the age of onset for, for many of these disorders. And what you can see here is the age of onset is 16, 17, 18 um, years of age. So many of uh, large proportions of, of the students who experience psychological distress, those symptoms started before they entered university or emerged during the first year of, of university. And that has particular um, significance in terms of thinking of, of, of upstream interventions. We can't begin to talk about the mental health of university students without talking about the mental health of high school students um, and what is happening um, upstream. Certainly part of the reason why the changes observed between 2017 and 2020, um, in the, 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 why those changes weren't so significant is that there are, um, the onset of symptoms was earlier and earlier. So what we find between 2015, 2017 and 2020 is that more and more students were arriving at university or with pre-existing conditions um, by, by, by uh, 2020. This does also have implications in terms of screening that it, it may be possible to, to screen students um, on registration or early in their, in their first year for those with, with um, histories of, of, of psychiatric dis, um, conditions and, and target them for, 
for uh, particular interventions. And I'm thinking here about targeted messaging um, or reaching out to those students to make them um, uh, aware of what services and support um, is available. But it also highlights the fact that there really is a need for a focus on, on first year students, that this is the age at which symptoms are, are if they haven't already emerged, are going, are like, uh, are um, likely to emerge and that there will be high numbers of first year students who, who require ad additional support. If I just try to sum up some of the implications for the prevalence estimates um, that, that I've shown you, um, the traditional treatment models and kind of one-on-one -on -one, um, treatment models are not going to be large enough to meet the demand for students. There are a large number of students who require interventions and thinking about one-on-one -on -one traditional approaches are um, are not going to are not going to work. That apart from depression and anxiety, we have a lot of talk about depression and anxiety. We also need to 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 keep in mind post traumatic stress disorder, um, hazardous substance use, and attention difficulties, which are also uh, common. And because of the age of onset, it may be possible to think about uh, early inter interventions. I do want to say something about suicide rates, and, and I'm showing you here the 12 month prevalence rates for suicidal behaviour, um, and these are quite high. 31.9 percent of students reporting suicidal ideation. 8.6% of students in the last year said they made a suicide plan, and 2.3% said they made a suicide attempt. These are significantly higher than we would observe in the general population. It's not altogether unusual for young adults to think uh, about life and death and to imagine what it, what it might be like to, to be dead. It might even be kind of developmentally appropriate as you as you realize that your, your position in the world um, and that you, you realize that it's a very large world and, and you, you occupy a very, very small place um, in, in that world. It might be normal to, to think about oh, what would it like be like not to be here and to play with ideas of autonomy and control. So uh, perhaps we shouldn't over interpret this 31% um, of students who have suicidal ideation, particularly because the question there was very broad. It was, have you had thoughts of death, um, which is you know, uh, perhaps not specific enough, but the high proportions of those with, with a suicide plan, the high proportions of students who've made an attempt is, is worrying. If there is a crisis in student mental health, I think this is 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 the crisis um, that the treatment gap, the proportion of students with each of with with um, diagnosable conditions who are not receiving treatment, um, about between sixty eight or is it sixty six sixty six and seventy seven percent of students with with a diagnosed um, condition are not receiving the treatment that they 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 should be getting. And we define treatment here very broadly. Um, we define it as any support for for psychological symptoms. This might be support from a traditional healer. It might be support from a religious leader. Um, so it's, it's a very broad definition of treatment. We weren't thinking narrowly here of, of psychiatric treatment, but even so, even making um, the, the definition of treatment quite broad, there are large numbers of students and a large unmet need um, for, for interventions. Why do students not access interventions? And this is, uh, we do have data from this, from the national survey, but I think it's, it's, it, important when we're planning services for, for students to, to keep in mind the developmental um, process of, of, of students and that they're at an age of increased autonomy, um, increased uh, self-reliance, uh, uh, um, increasing uh, focus on, on the peer group. And this means that it, they're unlikely to, to seek help um, from mental health professionals. Their first preference is to, to sort the problem out on their own or to access support from, from, from peers, um, but they're less likely to, to reach out to mental health professionals um, as their first port of call. Obviously, there, there are practical issues um, around scheduling, fitting in um, appointments around busy university schedules, their financial concerns um, about uh, affording it affording psychological treatment, but there are also uh, things like, like stigma and uh, perceptions of, of the effectiveness of, of treatment. Here were the reasons, the most common reasons students gave for not accessing care. And these were students who already recognized that they needed a problem, uh, that they needed assistance. So they recognized that they needed, that they had a problem and that they needed help, um, but they hadn't sought help. And we asked about the reasons why they, they then hadn't sought help. And these were the, the most common. And you can see there are um, things about finances there, about the cost of, of therapy, but there are other things that are kind of uh, 
psychological barriers that would be easier um, to, to, to overcome around the effectiveness of treatment, um, around stigma, about uh, self-sufficiency um, that are important to, to keep in mind. I think the point I'm trying to make here is that although there's a large unmet need, adding more services is not necessarily gonna solve the problem if there are still these barriers to accessing those services. So any intervention needs to take account of, of lowering um, these, these barriers and uh, increasing the student's ability to, to access support. I think we need to, to keep in mind that because of students' reluctance to, to reach out for help, um, because of their desire to, to, to be independent, that it means that they will present very late. They will usually present for, to, to, to counseling services when they're already in distress. Um, and the moment they start to feel better, they disengage. And so two further challenges are to think about crisis in, in interventions and crisis supports because they are um, part of, of what's gonna happen and in, in a sense, perhaps an unavoidable part of it. Thinking about how we can get students to, to reach out sooner before it becomes a crisis so that there's less of a demand on those crisis services, but also importantly to keep students retained in services um, beyond the, the initial uh, improvement in symptoms so that there is, they're kind of inoculated against uh, a recurrence of or relapse of, of symptoms um, later. Significant stressful events, I think, is, is important to look at like what are the kinds of things that students are, are having difficulties with. And again, they're not completely unexpected. Um, the academic concerns, there's uh, concerns about relationships and, and peers. In the context of COVID, there was concern about um, the health of a, of a family member, um, which is to be expected, but high number, a high proportion of students experiencing financial distress um, and, and academic pressure. I've kind of alluded to this earlier, but I just want to drive this point home and, and I realize I'm kind of running out of time. Um, so let me make this point quickly and it, 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 just to, to drive it home. I'm trying to, to remind us that students, particularly students at um, residential universities or at undergraduate students at residential universities on a particular developmental period in their lives when they are um, dealing with particular developmental challenges around autonomy, a need for choice, a need to exercise preference, um, explore identity, explore relationships, and they will need help um, negotiating some of these developmental tasks. But that's not the same as saying that they have a, a psychiatric condition. It also means that any services that we, we plan need to be developmentally designed around these. We are, are swimming upstream if we try and design services um, that are not aligned with, with, with these developmental tasks or that don't support the developmental trajectory um, of students. And I'll say a little bit more um, about that in this slide, actually, that it may be appropriate in thinking about uh, interventions to think about peer-to-peer -peer interventions, that they may be developmentally more, more appropriate, and to think about self-guided um, interventions that, that students can have greater autonomy over when they access help, how they access help, um, but also greater choice about the kinds of help that, they, that is available to them. And thinking here about a raft of, of interventions, um, a, a range of interventions will be uh, important if, we, if we're gonna take seriously the developmental stage of, 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 of students. I'm not gonna say something about conducting the survey because there are other things that are, that are more important, but I do wanna say that this was quite an education um, conducting the survey and it, it was hugely time consuming. Maybe actually I do need to, to make one point. It, was, it took us a year to just get permission from universities and agreement from everyone to, to, to do the studies. It was a, a year of lost time and a huge amount of resources that, that went into that. This is a serious barrier against ongoing research in the future, particularly as we move towards scalable testing scalable interventions across universities we're going to have to find a way to streamline um, the, the the permission process it works against collaboration it made me think at the end of this i don't want to work at any other university other than my own university um, because it's just too darn difficult to gain access and and to to jump through all the administrative hoops just about every university required the proposal to go to their ethics committee as their ethics committee required a change we had to go back to all the other ethics committees it was it was it was a nightmare but sorry i'm having my rant that's off my chest let me let me move on to, to what we started to do since 2020. Since 2020, we've started to look at alternative modes of, of intervention with students to try and think about other ways, particularly around the, the, the use of technology to, to deliver interventions. And these are not the panacea. These are not going to be the solution to all students with mental health, to the problems of all students with, with mental health. But there are a group of students that appear to be open to, to the idea of receiving help um, via the internet or, or, or via apps, um, and that they report uh, these apps as helpful. We piloted this as a, a, a semi-guided 
um, web-based intervention that consists of, of different modules around depression and anxiety, around learning to regulate your emotions, healthy sleep, healthy habits, those kinds of things. There is a coach on the other end who checks in with you, you know, we have noticed you haven't done anything this week, are you okay? Um, you know, we've been missing for two weeks. Um, we noticed you haven't logged into the, the modules. So giving that kind of feedback that there is a real person on the other end of it, but most of the intervention is delivered, um, as I say, on this web platform. And students had quite a positive experience of, of, of this intervention, at least the students who, who participated participated saying that this might be um, one way to, to, to reach them. And I think that's important to keep in mind that we may be able to scale up interventions fairly quickly and fairly cheaply because the marginal cost of these, these interventions is, is, is quite low um, and it will meet the need for, for some students, particularly perhaps as part of a step care model as the first level of, of entry with students who don't respond to these interventions within two or three, three weeks of, of the intervention being um, uh, scaled up to, to a more um, uh, intensive um, intervention. We also have experimented with this idea, and this is uh, running remote groups. Uh, these are real-time groups that were run on Teams, MS Teams, um, students who, who self-identified as, as having high levels of depression and anxiety and, and who wanted um, to, to learn skills to do that. We identified uh, psychological skills that, that are proven um, to, to be effective. So we weren't trying to test whether the intervention is effective, but rather we were trying to show that it's possible to deliver this intervention to students in groups um, over the internet um, over a period of, of, of 10 weeks. It was offered to the students during 2020, during lockdown. So there was a, a perhaps an, an added motivation for students to, to participate. They were hungry to connect with one another and to, to be in spaces with other students. And so the participation rate was quite high. The retention rate was quite high, but but we also saw, um, and the, the results were published um, earlier last year um, in the Journal of Internet Medicine, um, the results showed that there were, were significant improvements in levels of depression and anxiety. There was uh, high levels of satisfaction reported by students. And I think this is a particularly exciting uh, way of thinking about um, group interventions with students, the mo especially if we do this across campuses. It is possible to, you know, if, you, if you're working across four or five different campuses, you can literally have 10 different slots in the, in, in, in the week um, for students to choose from and for them to be part of, of groups with students from, from other campuses. And we've got funding to try that out. We'll, we'll show that it is possible, um, speaking ahead of myself, hopefully we'll show it's possible um, that, that these groups can be run across, across campuses. But then there is a sharing of resources. There's um, connecting students with uh, students from other environments um, and their um, yeah, there's a greater uh, anonymity. Um, we didn't require students to put their cameras on, for example. We encouraged them to, but if they didn't want to, they didn't have to. Um, and because there, there are, you know, it, that an anonymity also seemed to to lower the bar for for participation. In conclusion, I, I think my take home message is that the the picture's bad, but it's it's not that bad. 80% of students are reporting that they're in good or excellent mental health. There are 20% of students who meet criteria for a, for a psychiatric condition and will require treatment. 15% of them will require low intensity treatments, about 5% will require um, more intensive interventions. We're not gonna meet that demand with, with individual interventions, but we could um, think about other novel ways of, of, of reaching them, particularly through perhaps peer-to-peer -peer support or the use of te technology. I do think that by collaborating across universities, there are economies of scale and economies of scope. And, and what I mean by that is that if we plan interventions across three or four campuses, we can have a, a wider variety of interventions. We can have a web-based intervention. We can have a, a virtual group. We can have you know, app-based interventions. We can have mood monitoring interventions. You can have a broader suite of, of interventions and offer students more choices um, if we, we collaborate uh, across that. But this level of, of collaboration is a, is a long game. Um, it requires a, a, a kind of dedicated, focused research effort showing over time, you know, doing the pilots and feasibility study, showing that it can be scaled up, showing that it can be effective, then measuring that effectiveness against uh, treatment as usual. This is not going to be done by, by some researcher working on their own in isolation. It's only going to be, required, be possible if um, funding is earmarked and set aside 
to, to prioritize this research and, and to support this research. The South African Medical Research Council made money available for the national survey. Um, and it's that kind of uh, investment that, that, that is going to be important going forward. We need to, particularly around the invent, interventions, we need an investment across universities um, that earmarks uh, resources to develop um, a sustained focus on, on inter, um, interventions to promote student wellness. I've run over time, so I'm going to stop there and, and perhaps we can pick up some of this uh, conversation during, during the discussion. Thank you, Jason. That was great. And I was actually worried with the, your slides that there wasn't enough here, but I know you sped right through that. And there was a lot here. Jason, we've got some comments sure. and I wonder um, if I can ask you um, just quickly, I'm going to go into the chat. There is a, just for everybody to note, Handy could see us uh, post something in the chat about a chat box. And um, you can have a look at that, please. Um, it's very interesting. So Handy can share that. Um, Jason, Jason, I'm going to mute Gloria there. That's it. I'm going to, two questions. Um, Jason, there was a comment um, saying, in the light of insufficient traditional face-to-face -face approaches in some international institutions, they have then made use of mental health resource bots to do prompting and providing information-based support. Is anyone here aware of the institution doing it in South Africa? Are you aware of it? I'm not aware of any institution that is doing it, but there, you know, there probably there might be. So there might be others in the room who who can answer that. Chatbots are definitely um, you know one way to to go. Um, people who use them report high levels of of satisfaction, but the retention rate is is very high. So you find large numbers of people kind of downloading chatbots, but not necessarily engaging with them for extended periods. So there are a particular group of students who who would respond well to these kind of interventions. But we should absolutely be looking at them as one of the ways of, 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 of intervening. There's another, and, and it, which is perhaps a slightly different version. I mean, with a chatbot, there's an, it's artificial intelligence that's on the other end of it. So it's machine learning algorithms. Um, but there is something called campus talk, which is a, across universities, universities coming together and saying, you know, we're going to set up virtual counseling where students counsel students. So you're talking 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. There's somebody on the other end of the app, but it's a real student mm -hmm. who's been trained to, to deliver support in kind of a lifeline model. And that might be even more effective way to, to, to reach out to students to offer peer-to-peer -peer support, um, but using real humans on the other end rather than artificial intelligence. Okay, so the, the, then I've got a second one for you. Um, we had a comment at, um, about the onset age um, becoming younger and younger, and you said something about the onset age. Sorry, the question is, is the onset age signaling that the matric or the school is a traumatic um, time and that the damage has largely been done before higher education? That does seem to be the case for a large number of students, um, particularly around depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, that those... Um, things uh, are, are happening. We did in, in previous research show that the adverse childhood events were a very strong predictor of students who are going to develop um, psychological problems at their time at university, which implies that the damage was even done before um, high school, that that's students who have had adverse childhood events are at much, much higher risk. Yeah. Um, Jason, you said something about students um, um, on slide 16, you said something about students preferring help from somewhere else, not from professionals, but from friends and families. Is that not something we should understand or at least view as something healthy? Absolutely. I think it's developmentally appropriate. And I, and I was trying to perhaps badly make that point about developmentally appropriate services. Um, I don't think it's necessarily true for 100% of students, but it's typically um, the reason students give for not seeking help is that they'd rather um, sort it out themselves or, or at least try to sort it out themselves and, and access friends. And I think it is developmentally appropriate. Um, and we should be thinking about how can we roll with that um, to plan services rather than go against it. I think it's kind of um, it's interesting to link that data set to your suggestion to use peers, because if people are more comfortable going to peers and family and friends, um, we should equip them then to give very, very helpful and prompt and useful response. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, just another quick question. Some of them came to me privately, and it's quite interesting to see that some of the chats are coming privately. Perhaps people don't want to reveal um, their particular interest in some of these questions. Um, there was a question or you made a point about that we perhaps could screen students um, about pre-existing conditions before they register at university or as they register. 
I'm worrying a little bit about, so, so we would do that to target interventions very early on information sharing, letting them know what resources are there. So the intention's good, but it might be perceived as um, perhaps um, profiling or, you know, so the question is, would people even disclose that? That's a very good question. I think you could do it in a, in a kind of sensitive way. For example, some universities, I think it's in Belgium, on registration, students are prompted to do a mental health survey. Um, and it's, uh, they're given feedback immediately. So, you know, they, they get the results of their, their, their feedback. They can opt out of it, so they don't have to do it. And at the end of it, you're asked, would you like to receive messages um, about uh, services that are available? So students can also opt out um, of those. So I think there are ways that you can make it very easy for students, but at the same time, respect the desire not to. It's absolutely a way of profiling, um, but the, it, it, it may be worth considering. Um, it does mean that we can then, you know, if you think of, for example, if you identify students with, with substance use issues, um, to be able to target them with particular messages around support that is available, services that are available around substance use, um, you've got a much higher kind of hit rate of, of reaching the students that, that you need to reach. Also reaching them at the times when it's appropriate, students with a history of depression and anxiety, we know that around exam times, they're going to be an increased need or demand for services. So also stepping up the support of the messages that are sent out to those students that around exam time um, could be you know, we can get sophisticated about how we use it, but yes, I, there, of course, there, there are issues around it. Mm. Um, Jason, we've got a comment from Garth Stevens um, saying that what is the role of higher health? Um, you'd be aware of them, of um, um, Al Professor Alawalia. Um, so what is the role of higher health as such a collaborative site to generate the kinds of economies of scale that you're speaking about? Are you collaborating with them? Garth, good to, good to, to hear you. you. Um, they, I mean, Higher Health was the, the, was the leader in getting this national survey together. Um, they've helped us with, with, the, with these uh, internet groups. Um, so absolutely, they are providing leadership, but they have a limited in terms of resources. I and mean, they don't have, I mean, there are other people in the room who can speak better for Higher Health if Oliver's um, still here. But they can provide leadership, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they, they have um, the resource, financial resources. And, I, and it's up to VCs, I think, to make some of the decisions around uh, access to, to universities and facilitate the process that University of South Africa can encourage, but if VCs don't support that at a, at a ground level, hmm. um, there was a higher, there was agreement by, from all the VCs that they would all participate in the survey, but in the reality, when it came to the administrators at different universities, it just didn't filter down to, to that level. Sorry, yeah. that's a very long answer. Higher health of providing leadership, I'm sure they will continue to provide leadership, but we, we're going to need resources. I'm also thinking of Jason, of your little rant about how difficult it was to get access to the universities. What you're saying is we're not coordinated, we're not facilitating very quick access to data and to roll up all kinds of pilot things, evaluate them and change our ways. Um, so there's some barriers just in the way we communicate across the sector, even if higher health has got you know access and inroads for them. Sure. Jason, I want to move on to uh, Kiamo, if you don't mind. Um, there are tons of questions here. There's one, there's a comment here by Fatima, if you want to just look in the chats. She's posted a lovely link about peer-to-peer um, -peer support and what it's like in, in um, all kinds of communities. So Jason will share the PowerPoint. We will share the PowerPoint um, through, the, through your registration that you've done. So let me move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Kiamo Khetse Morve. And she is a lecturer. Camera, you can put your screen on, your camera on. Let me see where you are. I can't see you now. There you are. So Kiamo Morve, Dr. Morve, is a lecturer in the Department of Youth Study, Studies at the University of Venda. Her PhD is from the University of Malaga in Spain. She is a co-principal investigator in the collaborative HSRC Univen Unio Pretoria project on understanding violence and aggression in the context of the 2015-16 student movement in South Africa, a psychological well-being perspective. It's a book that they bring out. It's a huge study in a book. Dr. Moray has taught at university for almost two decades, supervised students at all levels, and published in local and international peer-reviewed journals. And um, Kim, I'm delighted to see you here and let's spotlight please her as our speaker and we look forward to hearing you. Thank you very much, Bridget, and to the organizing team. I'm about to share my screen now. Don't 
Perfect, thanks. What I'm going to talk about today basically is mental health within uh, universities. What Jason presented basically situates my, my, my talk, what I'll be talking about. However, I firstly would like to start with the South African context. In our country, we are faced with the triple challenges as politicians like to call them, poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And we recently were ranked the first in the levels of inequality in the world. So we are number one. When we look at the fact that in between 2020, in 2020, in 2020, February to April, about 2.5 million people lost their employment. One can tell that the situation in South Africa is not really good. Hence, our happiness index stands at 4.95, meaning that we are number 103 out of 146 countries that participated in this study. So we are actually not doing that very well. And when we look at these conditions, one can see that there's a likelihood that whatever is happening in our country would affect the university context and also our mental health. Mental health statistics in South Africa, according to Nguse and Wasanar, because they did a study to look at mental health during the COVID era, showed that 60% of us suffer from post-traumatic stress disorders, and those are linked to anxiety, depression, and substance use disorders. And women, particularly pregnant women, about 40% of them were also, were also depressed and only 27% of people who were identified had access to services. This is a very minimal number and it's very concerning that we have such a small number of people who have access to, to services. And we take this conversation to our universities because as Bridget said that Universities, when she was working at universities, she would see young people who are basically having this light in their eyes, who are enthusiastic all about life, you know, because they are moving into a new era of their life. But when you look at this, you know, it's very exciting because universities are all about advancement, research and innovation. And where there's research, where there's innovation, it means that people are adaptable. There is lots of knowledge and there is inclusivity because where the innovation, the fact that there's an innovation illustrates that there's openness, there's inclusivity and there's appreciation of the different types of knowledges. These different types of knowledges, however, they don't necessarily translate into the reality of the students or the staff members, in a sense that there are tensions within the higher education sector, the universities themselves. And I have typologized them into work-related factors, intrinsic and extrinsic factors. Our organizational cultures at universities that is very, there's lots of pressure, stressful. So basically Mangolochi and Ripenar Moses said that uh, universities are anxiety machines, pressure is normalized. We have this uh, adage, common adage that you publish or you perish, where now academ academics have to also Focus on, the, focus on their careers, but also ensure that they get third stream income for them to actually show that they are of value. And in relation to that, 
the sad part is that the competition that is in higher education tends to filter down to PhD students who are often always staff members. It filters down in what way? They are not allowed to actually state or share that they are under pressure. And being under pressure, the sleepless nights and everything else, one should see them as a badge of honor. And venting out and saying that I'm not coping is very taboo. And throughout the years, uh, the, academy, the academy has really changed from what it was because now the focus is on numbers instead of the, the quality, the experiences. Therefore, uh, Poalysis and Bazelian Hope share that academics are more prone to stress than any other community within the university sector. And now when we come to intrinsic and external factors, extrinsic factors, as I said initially that academics, there's an element of the badge of honor. It is taboo to actually speak about what is going on with me. I am not coping. That, that, that is one of the dilemmas that people in the academy Feel, they feel that they are not allowed to speak. As a result, they feel inadequate. There's self-doubt, there's isolation. And we cannot run away from the fact that we have previous traumas. South Africa is one of the most um, violent country. We have different types of traumas that shape who we are. And this would also be carried through into how we relate into our environment and um, foster this in, inadequacies, self-doubt and isolation and loneliness. Whereas the external factors are the poor living conditions. During the COVID pandemic, what we realized, what came through was that the level of gender-based violence, the statistics just rocked up. And that is quite concerning. And furthermore, people within the academy were are, are basically unable to cope with, with the work-life balance because of, and this is also uh, in, impacted upon by the introduction of social media networks in, the, in our everyday lives, in our everyday spaces. So by so doing, now people, there, there's no, there's no clear delineation between the private and the public space. And other uh, people stated that they are worried about their financial changes, uh, financial challenges. But also people are afraid to speak because of the stigma. Jason spoke about this, that stigma. And when we look at COVID, COVID compounded all of this, the anxiety, the depression, and the stresses. People are worried about their job security and their personal health. The majority of uh, staff members within higher education are more than 40 years old. And there's a likelihood that they have a comor comorbidity issues. And that is very, that was very worried. They were worried about their personal health. And also the uncertainty that clouded and that continues to cloud um, COVID. For once in our lives, universities were also not in the know. They didn't know, people didn't know what should be happening. The only solution that we had was to wash hands. And that was one of, this is one of the most basic solutions for a very complex, you know, virus. Also, people were depressed. Staff members passed away from COVID. Staff members, not only staff members, but also students. 
in relation to this, the very same people who are in this sector are parents, are aunts, are uncles, and they also have to deal with their issues of bereavement. And the fact that we were isolated, you know, coming to work, have, going outside, provide the person with some element of structure and routine. And by not, so, by not doing that, people were caught up in environments alone or with people who cannot necessarily afford them spaces to vent. Churches were closed. For a majority, South Africa is characterized as a Christian country. And going to church offers people that, that sense of release, that sense of belonging. And in relation to stress, academics had to wonder, how do we salvage the academic year? Uh, will we be able to do what we are expected to do within this short period of, uh, short period of time, considering that it's not only us as academics who are, who are facing issues of bereavement and uncertainty, but also the students with whom we are working. And another concern is linked to anxieties about going back to the universities. Because going back to the universities, when we know that the statistic, vaccination statistics of the young people between 15 and 35 are very low, and considering that the people who are in higher education have comorbid comorbidity issues, then that was a very huge concern. So, as I said, that the slides, the previous slides indicate that we have so much as South Africans, and it also filters into the higher education. So, the question that we need to ponder on is. How does the depressed lens or anxiety-dominated life influence how one views the world and engages with it, including teaching, research, and perception of data? I don't necessarily have answers to this question, but I believe that what we go through shapes us, and what we go through is seen in how we relate and how we basically interact with others. So this is the question that I leave to the audience. So what can we do to promote help-seeking behaviors? Education and awareness, basic. A, study, a comparative study that was done between uh, South Africans and the Germans showed that the South Africans were not even aware that depression is diagnosable. And secondly, that the, 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 there was an element of stigma. And this stigma came not only from colleagues or every, but significant others, family members and friends. So it is very important that we challenge the stereotypes. We have, in, in South Africa, we have an African culture that says that men don't cry. Um, even, President Zuma once said that depression doesn't exist in African culture. What is depression in, in, in an African language? We don't have that. And by him saying that, that depression doesn't exist, it discourages people from seeking help, even when they are aware that we, we do need help. And also we need to there needs to be support and training. We need to acknowledge as higher education that we, we are infallible as human beings and we need to create circles of care. Mainly up looking at African healing methods. The reason being that our healing methods are mainly communal. They are not individualistic and they are ritualized. So whether the ritual, whether the community, it becomes my pain is your pain and we can share this pain. And the peer counseling doesn't necessarily mean to young people, the students, but also the adults 
the staff members who are in here or, or uh, in the universities and there needs to be continuous messages mental health messages just like the adverts that we see online which tell us that a product would work even though we have never seen that particular product but we'll go and buy it and our health sticking behaviors also can be facilitated by ensuring that there's recreation and sporting activities. These activities help in coping, ensuring that people have, people can cope, people can adapt, and there are outlets. And in different universities, such do not necessarily exist. And it is, it is important also to focus on holistic health that includes nutrition and health. And the proposed higher education responses basically mean that we need compassionate leaders, leaders who are coherent, leaders, leaders who are compassionate, basically help people to be coherent and facilitate their, their coping. When it comes to boundaries, we need to set clear boundaries in terms of our relationship with students in, uh, or uh, with colleagues and the work-life balance. We need to establish norms and capabilities what works for one person wouldn't necessarily work for another person. And we need to be aware of inclusivity issues and the power dynamics. In South Africa, we have a phenomenon called um, sexually transmitted marks, where male lecturers were, or people who are in power, mainly male, would coerce those who, are, who would not have power to do what they want basically to, for, for, for sexual favors. So it's very important that we explore and challenge those, those, those uh, dynamics and act on them. Lastly, we need to, when, when these responses are particularly are from my leaders, then we do not have the us and them phenomenon. We have a collective identity that fosters belonging, support, and resilience. The, my message basically is that we can change our organizational culture. We can model helping. We can model how to ad address and interact with mental health, encourage health seeking behaviors because Staff members are aware when we have when a colleague has challenges. It's just that they are afraid of how to intervene. And also, the last thing is that we need to bring that spark back into the eyes of our students. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kim Moretze. It was lovely um, to hear your um, view on the staff um, experience in higher education. There is a comment I want to make, particularly on your um, slide um, nine, when, you, when you're foregrounding what it might do to our collective research and our collective lens. If we have an experience of depression and anxiety, how that impact on the work that we do and how we view the world, I think that's a very critical question. Um, both of you, Jason and Kiamo, you were both um, focusing on the one hand on the context that is perhaps causally certainly contains the precipitants for mental illness. Um, in the context, but you largely also focused on the individual. Um, what do you think we should do to make for healthy context? I mean, it's about, you know, so I'm imagining that a lot of the kind of ill health comes from the context that people live in. So I wonder if you want to say something about um, what we can do individually to impact the context to make it a healthier one. Maybe just mention one thing, Kiamo. Normally what I do in class, I, I, I do speak about mental health issues with students. And I tell them where to get help. And I also encourage young men to cry. I tell them that when you don't cry, there's a lump that, that sticks on your throat. So it's very important to be in touch with your feelings. So I basically, discuss about mental health issues. And I tell them that there is help within the university. You can always get help. 
there are people who are there for you. So that's what I normally do. Okay. Jason, is there something you can add to that? Um, not really. I mean, you're raising a very interesting point that we, we need to look at systemic interventions and think about organizational culture. Mm -hmm. And these are much, much harder places to intervene. It's much easier to talk about adding a counselor than changing an institutional uh, culture. I suspect that some way to start might be around relationships. I mean, that learning happens in the context of relationships, thinking about relationships between staff, relationships between students that are nurturing, addressing bullying, um, addressing harassment, all of those kinds of things. And not just paying lip service to those things, but really trying to change the, the culture around that. I suspect it's really hard for staff to support students if they're not feeling supported themselves and if their psychological health is is not good so kind of a whole institution wellness um would, would probably be another good place to to start around changing culture um but it's they're probably sociologists and anthropologists who can can answer that question much more um uh, articulately mm. i suppose i'm concerned that we think about the treatment rather than just the you know the causes i know there's not a linear relationship between an event or a cause or a childhood or an experience and the later mental health but we have indications that if the context is a wholesome safe one and loving one at home there is a better chance of avoiding severe mental illness later and um, so i'm concerned about how do we shape a context that um you know the factors that Kiamu has mentioned right early on um, about the sort of um, the intersection of the contextual factors that make for um, mental illness. So I want to thank both of you. We're going to have to come to an end. We end just before half past. Kiamu, thank you very much for your presentation. Jason, and thank you for yours. We're going to share that with the participants. Um, there is an evaluation link in the chat box. Please, can everybody click on it? It'll ask you three quick questions, and. Um, we then get an evaluation and we have our next engage in about a month. We'll have Hans de Witt, who most of us, you, most of you would know, is an international, um, a very large international voice in internationalization of higher education. And we look forward to having him in about a month from now. So thank you, everyone. You're welcome to put your cameras on so we can greet each other. And, um, and then we sign off. Thank you very much for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye, Noren. Nice seeing you.